As we stated during one of the first main videos of the statics course, the reason to find internal forces within members is to, with them, calculate the different types of stresses a material is subjected to and compare them to material properties such as strength. The process ends up being much more complex than this, but in general, if the stress exceeds the strength of the material, the material will fail. You'll learn more about stresses and material properties in other courses, like a Mechanics of Materials course, but for statics, we still need to be able to identify the internal forces that a structure or member is subjected to. So far, we know how to identify the axial internal forces. We covered two force members and how and why they are only subjected to axial loads that cause tension or compression. Link below to that specific section for that video. Other than axial forces, a member can be subjected to other external loads that can cause it to twist, bend, and shear. And even though the twisting caused by a torsional load, which we usually call a torque, is just a moment that affects the axis of the member we're analyzing. And we make a distinction between torques and moments to state that torques cause torsion and moments cause bending. And we will cover those shear forces that cause bending first. These internal forces and moments can be found using the method of sections we studied in the previous video. The difference here is that when we are trying to find the internal shear and bending moments, we're usually just looking at a single member as opposed to the more complex looking truss structures we studied then. Any external load that affects the axis of the beam or member will be known as an axial load and any external load that is perpendicular to the axis of the beam will be known as a shear load. The name comes from it causing a shearing stress, which you'll learn more about in later courses. Link below if you're interested. Any load that is not purely parallel or perpendicular to the axis of the member can of course be decomposed into its orthogonal components to treat them separately as axial or shear loads. These shear loads will not only cause shear within the structure's material, but they will also cause a bending moment at any non-zero distance from its location. This bending moment will result in a bending normal stress, which will also be essential to study the potential failure of the material. Of course, to find if a material is going to fail, you need to identify where the stresses are maximum, and for that, in the case of shear and bending, you need to identify where the internal shear forces and bending moments are maximum. Depending on the external load types and load distribution, identifying the critical location along the axis of the member where the shear forces have a maximum value can be non-trivial. And the same is true about finding the location along the axis of a member where the bending moment is maximum. From a technical standpoint, you would find the critical locations where the internal loads are maximum by performing an infinite number of cuts along the axis of a member, draw a free body diagram, and solve for the internal forces at the cut, which are basically just the reaction forces to the rest of the loads you see up to the cut. So let's first look at the different types of external loads that can affect a member, and we'll use the terms beam and member interchangeably here, since the effect of those loads are the same for any member, and they're mostly applicable to structures that have a clear axis direction like beams, shafts, and rods. At this point, you're probably very familiar with point loads. These are represented by force vectors and are usually caused by a physical interaction with another body where the contact with it is concentrated in a very small location. So for example, two members connected by pins will in reality have their interaction forces distributed along the contact surface of the pin. But since that area is so small, it is reasonable to assume it as a point load. The same can be said about, for example, a person at the end of a diving board. Compared to the surface and overall geometry of the diving board, the person's weight can be interpreted as a point load. Then we have distributed loads. The simplest kind would be a constant value distributed load whose location is bound by the physical interaction between bodies. A box of homogeneous density on a beam can be represented by this type of load. In 2D, the dimension on the horizontal axis would tell us where the distributed load begins and ends, and the distributed load value W would be equal to the weight of the box divided by the length A. The load density W times A would give us the total load. Then there's the triangular or trapezoidal distributed loads. For example, the wing of an airplane will be subjected to a lift force that decreases as we move away from the fuselage. In reality, the lift force on the wing of a plane might not be linear, but a reasonable simplification can be a triangular or trapezoidal distributed load. However, if more accuracy is required, a distributed load can be written as any mathematical function of x, wx. 
And finally, we have the external couples. We talked about the name couples in the rigid body equilibrium main video, link below. This is the name we use for an external moment caused by two opposing forces of equal magnitude equidistant from the location where the external couple is created. So since the opposing forces are counteracting each other in terms of translational acceleration, meaning that the sum of forces is zero and no reaction forces are caused by them, we represent the external couples as a moment applied to a specific point along the beam or member. So to find the internal loads along the beam and to find the critical shear and bending moment locations, which is where they present the highest values, we do not use infinite number of cuts. To make this process easier, we use shear and bending moment diagrams. In some cases, only a finite number of cuts are required to identify the internal shear forces. For example, a simply supported beam subjected to a point load will result in a free body diagram that shows three point loads. In this case, only two cuts, one between A and B, and one between B and C, are needed to find what the value of the internal shear force along the beam is. The internal shear force V between A and B would be 5 kN going down, and the internal shear force V between B and C would be 5 kN going up. Now, many textbooks and many instructors will simplify explaining the direction and sign of these shear forces by saying that the convention is for shear forces V to be positive when pointing down and negative when pointing up. And this is only true if the cut is performed from left to right. It would then be the opposite if the cut is performed from the right to the left. In reality, there's no need to contradict the natural and very global convention of up being positive and down being negative. What we're actually doing with the shear force diagram is plotting the forces up to the cut and not the reaction force at the cut. So up is in fact up and down is in fact down. The reaction force at A being a positive 5 kN load will bring the shear diagram plot up Nothing is changing between A and B since there are no loads there. Then at B we would see the 10 kN going down and then at C we go back up. These shear force diagrams should always end at a zero force otherwise the structure is not in equilibrium. As opposed to the shear diagram, for the bending moment diagram we do actually plot the reaction at the cut, meaning the internal bending moment. A cut anywhere between A and B would show us that the internal slash reaction moment is a positive value that counteracts what RA is generating. And since this moment is dependent on X, we plot the value from A to B as a straight line with a Y intercept B of 0 and a slope equal to 5. The value at B would therefore be 5L. A cut anywhere between B and C would show us that the internal slash reaction moment is still a positive value that counteracts what R, A and P are generating. And since this moment is dependent on X as well, we plot the value from B to C as a straight line with a Y intercept of 10 L and a slope of minus 5 which only describes the moment between B and C. The value at C would be therefore 0. Just like the shear diagrams, the bending moment diagrams should also end at zero to show that the body is in equilibrium. Notice that the slope of the bending moment diagram is the value that we see for the shear force diagram. This is of course no coincidence. For any beam subjected to a collection of different types of external loads, we can perform a really tiny cut along the beam. If we are drawing all the reaction loads at both ends, we would have a moment at the left and a moment plus a small change in moment on the right, of course in the opposite direction. The same would be true for V. V going up on the left and V plus delta V going down on the right. We see that for a sum of forces in Y, we have the two internal shear forces and the force resulting from the distributed load, Wx times the length. This means that delta V is equal to Wx times delta X, which if the cut is really an infinitesimal cut where delta X approaches zero, dV dx is equal to Wx. This means that the slope of the shear diagram is equal to the distributed load intensity W, or what is the same, that delta V is equal to the integral of Wx dx, meaning that the change in shear is equal to the area under the curve. If we now perform a sum of moments about the cut on the right, we'd see the reaction moments, 
The moments caused by the reaction shear force on the left, since the one on the right causes a zero moment in that location, and the moment caused by the distributed load, wherever that distributed load is concentrated at. Solving for delta m and letting delta x approach zero once again, we see that the slope of the moment diagram is equal to the shear value, which is what we concluded from the example before. Just like with the shear and distributed loads, this can be written as the change in moment to be equal to the area under the shear diagram plot. With these relationships, the only thing we're missing is clarifying with an example how you would represent an external couple in the bending moment diagram. We already stated that if the external shear forces go up, the shear force diagram plot goes up. For example, the reaction force at A. This is because in the shear diagrams, we are plotting the shear forces up to that location, not the reaction shear forces. Since what we are plotting in the bending moment diagram is the actual internal load, which is the reaction to the loads we see from the free body diagram at the cut, for example, an external couple like MA would be a counterclockwise and therefore positive moment, and the reaction to that would be a clockwise and therefore negative internal moment, even nanometers away from the reaction. This means that for bending moment diagrams, positive counterclockwise couples bring the internal moments that we're plotting on our bending diagram downward. The reason we don't also plot the reaction shear forces in the shear force diagram, like we do with bending, is because the final goal of this process is finding the internal moments to calculate the bending normal stresses. To do that, we use the shear force diagrams only as an intermediate step to visually obtain the slopes we need to draw the bending moment diagrams. If we were interested in finding the shearing stress due to transverse shear, which requires the internal shear force, we would indeed need to plot the negative of what we are currently plotting in our shear diagrams. Let's look at a quick and simple example where we make use of what we've learned today. And if you want to check out more complex examples, make sure to check out the example links in the description below. If we want to find the shear and moment diagrams, we would begin with a free body diagram to find the reactions at A and B. A sum of moments about A allows us to find BY and the sum of moments about B, AY. The shear diagram with the x-axis in meters and the y-axis in newtons would go up at A, down at C and E, and up at B. For the bending moment diagram and with the y-axis now in newton meters, we would start at zero because there's no external or reaction couples at A. With a slope of 450 for 1 meter, we would reach 450 at C. With a slope of minus 350 for another meter, we would reach 100 at D. And we would find a negative external couple that would cause a reaction moment that is positive, bringing us up by 1200 to 1300 newton meters at D. The slope from D to E would still be minus 350, that for another meter would bring us down to 950. And finally, with a slope of minus 950 for an additional meter, we would reach zero at B. Notice that the area under the curve of the shear diagram corresponds with the Y values between each section in the bending moment diagram. For more shear and bending moment diagram examples, as well as the other videos of the statics course, make sure to check out the links in the description below. Thanks for watching.